Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy almost new year, everyone, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. This is the show in which I celebrate artists and their body of worth. And I am so excited about today's show. Uh, Before we begin, I wanna let everyone know that I am a product of 1960s and 70s television. And the only thing that this year could remind me of is the Twilight Zone. Uh, This has been the most bizarre year Uh, that any of us uh, have ever been through. And just before we went live, we got word that another beloved icon from 1960s television, Don Wells, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, uh, passed away and succumbed to COVID. So I send my love out to her loved ones, her friends, her family, those who knew her intimately and closely, Uh, She is in our thoughts and prayers. I had the good fortune of interviewing Dawn, I guess about two years ago, uh, when her book, What Would Mary Ann Do?, uh, came out, which was, and it still is, an incredible read. So if you get the chance, uh, by all means, read this book. And our guest today, Jackie Joseph, I also came to know through 1960s and 70s television. Uh, Whether we were seeing her as Rowena or the original Audrey in Little Shop of Horrors, which we are going to talk about, uh, or the Dara Stage Show or any of the other incredible shows or game shows that we would see her on, uh, it is such an honor to have her on this show today. Um, About seven years ago, uh, I we became Facebook friends, and I saw that she was going to be in New York. So I reached out to her, and I said, I would love to interview you on stage in front of an audience, and we will make this a benefit for the charity of your choice. And the charity of her choice is and was Actors and Others for Animals. You will see it at the bottom of the screen. If you enjoy today's show, and I know you're going to, please make a donation to Actors and Others for Animals if you can. Uh, I know it's a difficult time for a lot of people, but if you're able to do so. Now, before we bring Jackie on, as I said, I grew to love her uh, from all these television appearances that she would do. And I want to give a big shout out to my dear, dear friend, Charles Pennington, uh, because he put together this special montage that we are about to see, and I could not have done this without him. Jackie Joseph, today I celebrate you. Enjoy. Are you a dilettante, a dabbler, or a dealer? Oh. Excuse me. I was attempting meditation to achieve the proper spiritual intensity for my work. Don't feel sad, Seymour. Don't waste your pity on me, Audrey. I'm not worth it. Who says you're not? Everybody. Yeah, I know. Oh, boy, you kiss good, Audrey. Oh, I guess I just have a good kisser. I'm hungry. Seymour. I didn't mean it. Why did you say it? Oh, food. You didn't even say that. Oh, yes, I did. I said it. I said it. Oh, I'm looking right at you. I'm a ventriloquist. You're what? A ventriloquist. Feed me! <laughs> That's wonderful, Mr. Gossage. <laughs> no, I could. I could. Why don't you let me heft you once, huh? No, I'll set you right down as soon as you say. Huh? <laughs> oh, See that? <laughs> you are strong. <laughs> I-, I once held up a goat like this whilst the vet gave him a shot. <laughs> well, I guess it's true. There is a woman for every man. <laughs> See, seen enough? This could be a lot of fun. Oh, it will be fun. Sure is easy to see who Teacher's pet is. 
could I ask a favor of you? Sure, what is it? Well, you know that new show, Lollipops and Onions? Uh-huh. Well, one of the girls is leaving the show, and they want me to audition for one of the onions. <laughs> hey, that is great! I know, but I have a problem. The audition is tonight, and I have to find someone to fill in at my regular job. So in case I don't get the part, I still have my regular job. Okay. Yay! Eloise. Mm -hmm. Eloise, Eloise, Eloise. <laughs> Eloise, darling. Sweet Eloise. Eloise, Eloise. 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 Oh, Eloise. Eloise. Oh, Eloise. Oh, Eloise. Eloise, you don't have to go do your reading. No, well, we do have an appointment. Uh, oh, Eloise, no, no. Please, Today, Eloise. Eloise. Come on. Well, you're such fun. Maybe a minute. Hey, <laughs> girl, Eloise. Eloise is going to stay. Here we are, the four of us all together again. Just like it used to be. Roger, Carol, Eloise. <laughs> and him. <laughs> she asks for me, tell her I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> she can still live together and love together. Always a little joke and always a little laugh. Guess the honeymoon's over, huh? Don't be silly. I still love you. Oh. You just make me stick to my stomach. Something individual, something unique. Not a name that you bump into every day of the week. Like Elvis, Raquel, Petula, Engelbert, Minnie, Minnie. Maxie. Maxie, Bikini, Bikini. Yeah, Bikini Bono. Yeah, I kind of like that. Sonny, get down here. <laughs> oh, I think he's just adorable. He says his name is Bleep. You're in, Bleep. From now on, you're one of Josie's pussycats. <gasps> Monsieur Bobby Darren, oh, mon Dieu, it is a pleasure and an honor to come. Ah, oh, and Miss Mademoiselle Jackie, ah, oh, yes. won't you come into my place? Thank you, thank you very much. Please, I say vous, Mademoiselle. Oh, Lovely. Ah. Here's the season to be jolly. La, 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 la. Right, Murray? that gentleman to help you. Which gentleman are you talking about? Well, that one right there. The one who's black. What? <laughs> the one who's black. I still remember the day Mr. Greenspan coined the term irrational exuberance. He had taken a longer than usual tub, and as he sat in the soapy water... I had made a mistake. Cam was off on an adventure while I sat there dying of boredom, surrounded by people dying of natural causes. <laughs> Jackie Joseph, I have to tell you, I, everybody, I had the upper hand because I could watch your reactions on the wings. Uh, put together by my dear friend, uh, Charles Pennington, Chuck Pennington, and uh, oh, so thank, thank you. you. So what do you think? I, I enjoyed that so much. It, it's really, a, funny because I'm enjoying myself but I really see her as that young girl who <laughs> now that I'm, I look back I think what a clever young girl well you know you look at certain actors and actresses you being one of them and I can't think of anyone else doing these roles um one particular role of course we saw a clip was from the Andy Griffith show in which you played Rowena uh, I think you did only one episode, and yet people feel to this day that you were a series regular on the show. Yeah, well, they rerun it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, what's it like looking back at all? Uh, you know, all of these incredible roles that you did, and the people that you got the opportunity to work with. Uh, the, the people are so fantastic. Like in the Andy Griffith show, besides the obvious, Andy and Don. Um, Don Knotts, uh, to work with a Howard Morris, who was an idol from the Sid Caesar show. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, to work with Sid Caesar, which uh, was in the sketch with uh, Bobby. Uh, it, it's just, it's inconceivable 
it was so wonderful because I I always regretted that I I felt it was not professional to ask people to take a picture with me, you know, to have a real camera. It's before they had uh, iPhones, and uh, so now I kind of wish that I, that I wasn't so professional. And and uh, you know, when I was working with Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda. And the director, that was in the Cheyenne Social Club, and Gene Kelly was the director. And I thought, and I didn't ask for pictures with these people, you know? Well, I, I want to go back uh, to the very beginning. You were born in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, but uh, I want to know a little bit about your family growing up. Uh, were, was yeah. your family in the arts? Uh, what did your parents do? Uh, and how did your path to uh, show business begin? Oh, boy. That's a little stretch. My family is, is very interesting because uh, my mother's mother, my maternal grandmother, was a victim of the influenza, the Spanish terrible mm. flu. Wow. Wow. So as a result of that, my mother and her four other siblings all went to the Jewish orphan's home in Chicago. And because of that, uh, you have a whole different trajectory of what, what is behind your family. And um, my mother left there in a snit when she was 16. She, she was a tough young girl. And uh, it must have been to a cousin because somebody put her on a train from Chicago to Los Angeles. And she went and stayed with uh, my father's grandparents who, of course, she wasn't married to him at the time. But so she married him at 17 and he died hmm. three months before I was born. Oh, wow. When she was 19. So I had this um, funny space of a family. Um, his parents were wonderful. They were great, wonderful grandparents. They were from Russia and... Um, you know, that whole gang that came over from Russia. And he was one of seven brothers. So just like 40 years later, I found a bunch of Joseph cousins that um, kind of started a late in life family group. But um, they had a little tiny uh, used five and dime store in downtown Los Angeles. And the whole back of it is where they live. One giant room with 10,000 cracks in the wall. It was an old garage repair before. And they decorated it with the um, bread used to come in a package with little colored tin foil. So they had made little balls of silver and blue tin foil, and those were the room separators. So it, in this one big room, they put little pictures of anything. I mean, these darling Jewish refugees with pictures of Jesus and the sun shining down. It was just beautiful. And it was like a magic place. And, and, and they also had an upright piano, so I could pretend I could play. Uh, so it was not your usual uh, upbringing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, my mother was the single person during World War II. I thought she was extremely patriotic because we used to go down to uh, Union Station downtown and pick up servicemen and bring them home. <laughs> Be careful saying that, Jackie. <laughs> I mean, hello. Yes. Now, when you were uh, in grammar school, uh, yes. did you do any plays or anything in school? Well, my grammar school didn't have drama, but they had a harmonica band. And uh, so we get to march around with a sash going, rum, 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 rum. and so I thought that was show business. And... Uh, Luckily, in junior high school, I had girlfriends whose parents could afford to send them to a young actor's company. Mm -hmm. And I used to get, go on the streetcar with them, so I was allowed to watch. And uh, the teacher one day said, well, why don't you get up and do something? And she included me in. And this teacher is an iconic lady called Viola Spolin. Oh, my God, yes. 
she invented improvisation. And she was writing a book based on improvisations we were doing. And I got into the class because the word tuition wasn't in our, and my mother worked for a liquor store, so she could put on her coat every week and stick a big bottle down her sleeve. And that was my tuition, you know, Viola accepted that and they became girlfriends. And uh, I had a lot of years with this exceptional woman. And my favorite thing is she put me in a little play and I had a little tiny part. And I, I struck her funny when I read the lines. And instead of just, <laughs> she went, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> a big message that you can be funny. And, and I just, I mean, that was a lightning bolt for me, that big ha-ha. And was that the moment, you know, when everything changes in a person's life and you decide this is what I'm going to devote my life to? I think that was just what I was doing. She started putting me in place and we would all read for the part. And I got to be the empress in the emperor's new clothes. And then I had this... Uh, desperate moment of thinking I can do this because there was an evil part in a play called Once Upon a Clothesline. It's about two clothespins in love and but their their tyrannical enemy enemy, hello, was a spider and she was evil. And I read for the spider went much to everybody's shock. And I suddenly had depth and scope and and got to play the spider and i became her leading lady in children's theater and i kept doing that into high school and naturally high school drama and but lacc um really helped put me on the map because i was doing a play a, an original musical called heads i win uh about the life and wives of Henry VIII. And Henry VIII was James Coburn with wow. in my class. And, and um, I mean, in the audience of this hysterical musical was a, a producer of a play called uh, The Drunkard and the Wayward Way, which was a, a an attraction in Los Angeles for 36 years. And New and, York as well, uh, ah, at the 13th Street Theater, yes. Well, that became my night job. They hired me and I got paid like $50 a week. It was amazing. And I worked seven nights a week. Uh, two nights we did the melodrama and five nights the musical. And I did that for three years and that gives you a lot of experience with, with audiences, you know, especially audiences that yelled at you. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a great fun. And they also had an oleo, so we got to sing songs. And now, that, you also were in the Billy Barnes Review. Did the Billy Barnes yeah. Review come, you know, right after that? Or after were, that. After right that. After that. After three years of auditioning, I got hired by the Sacramento Music Circus. Uh, I was 22 then, and uh, to be in their chorus. And because going up there on the train, I met Joyce Jameson. I mean, oh, she was yeah. for half the trip, and and she had giant rollers in her hair and all black. And and I thought, oh, she must be a dancer. I, you know, in those days, we thought dancers were racy people, mm -hmm. which a lot of them are, thank goodness. Um, but I got to know Joyce, and I was in the chorus. But when Billy came up to see her, because they were married, uh, which was strange, but and they had a child, and uh, we, they, she said, come out to dinner with us. And so... Billy just, you know, we were chattering and I was this young chorus girl and he said, well, we're doing this show in Los Angeles. When you finish uh, the season, you want to be in it? It was just that easy. <laughs> I mean, convoluted, but 
it was in my lap. And how long were you with the Billy Barnes Review? Oh gosh, a, a different uh, variations, you know. We, but our, our biggest opening was at the uh, Los Palmas Theater in Los Angeles in 1958. And it just caught fire in LA. It was like the only show in town. Mm -hmm. And um, the in the cast was Ken Berry. That's where we met, and um, Bert Convey, and uh, then Bob Rogers, who wrote the show, and um, oh help! I, I know that Jameson was in the show. Uh, oh, Lenny Weinrib. How could I forget him? He um, he was a kid, and who suddenly became very famous voice actor. And uh, and character, he was puffing stuff. <laughs> uh, now, was it because of this review that you started getting the attention of the executives at the studios? That's when people saw you, because people used to come back over and over, and um, you know that's when you get cast without even having to try. That's how I got Andy Griffith's show, because um, the producer had seen Billy Barnes' review. <laughs> And uh, that's also probably how I got Little Shop of Horrors because I had an essence of um, of innocence. Well, it's funny. I was doing some research on Little Shop of Horrors, and uh, and I was shocked to hear that you shot the entire film in three days. Two. 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 <laughs> well. <laughs> And my fingers, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. two days. And the reason was that they had this space because Roger's brother had been shooting a movie and had two days. So he decided to do a quickie movie. I was in New York. I They flew me in and I thought this is such a big deal. It was a detective movie. But while I was flying, they rewrote the whole movie uh, that's Chuck Griffith, who was the writer and also played a lot of parts in the movie. And they had to finish by the end of 1958. No, 59. That was, sorry, time flies. Uh, because the new SAG contract that offered residuals went into effect in 1960. So that by necessity, we, we had to memorize the script uh, luckily, Jonathan Hayes and I had a few days before the shoot uh, while they were making the sets and building it. And we ran from scene to scene. Uh, if I had a clothes change, it was in a carpenter's booth. And, uh, and very quickly did this a little movie. It was, a, it was. I mean, of course, when you're doing something like this, you never know what the outcome is going to be. But does it surprise you the success that this film has so many years and, of course, it went on to be a major musical? I, I was astounded. And we didn't know for a little while because it came out and it was there. And then years later, I started getting fan mail with dead leaves falling out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I was telling everyone, I have this plant that's behind me that I call the Auden II uh, that you gave me when we were at your home in Los Angeles from your garden. And I said, well, the perfect name for this. And it's just growing. You can't see it, but it goes all over the place. I am so thrilled that I'm all over your house. I, it's everywhere. It's it's just great. When um, when did you feel that you, uh, your first big break on television uh, came along? Because you were what we affectionately call in the business a journeyman actor. Uh, you were going from project to project to project. And of course, looking at the body of work that you did, um, it seems to me as an outsider that you had this continuous career. Um, was it like that at all? Or were there lulls along the way as well well it was it was like that uh but there was like space in between because my main priority since i got married in 1960 was to be as good a wife as possible and then when we adopted our children um as good a mommy as possible and i had definite criteria i i couldn't do anything that went out of town i couldn't do a series because series would take too mm -hmm. much 
uh, time. And uh, it wasn't until Ken was really sure he would never work again. That was after maybe RFD was canceled. Mm -hmm. He was so, um, you know, he just blew up and was destroyed. And he said, you have to go back to work. And, and uh, the phone rang and it was the Doris Day show. I said, we know you don't want to do a series, but would you mind coming and being on our show? I said, oh, well, can, I, can I share something with you? Because you know, you and I have talked about this many times. I have such a love of Doris Day. I want to share, since you bring this up, I want to share this with you. Oh. Jackie! Hmm? Jackie, will you try to catch Doris, please? Sorry, Mr. Bennett. She just went down in the elevator. Not ours to see. Okay, set up, set up. How are things in the new job? I just got here. Will you give me time? How are things over there? Jackie? What? Where's my extra set of car keys? How should I know? But, um, what do you say? Okay. What is it? Do you mind sleeping over tonight? All right. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so much fun. Again, I have to give a shout out to my friend Charles for putting that together. Me uh, too, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> he does that, Chuck Pennington, he does great work. Anyone, if you're putting together a montage, that's the guy to call. So you get the call to do the Doris Day show. Um, and had you and Doris had ever met before that? I had done her last movie, uh, but as I'm prone to do, I I don't bother anybody on set because I assume that everybody's in their head wondering what they're going to do. So I never go, oh, hello, I love you so much, or none of that stuff. I was I was such a stick in the mud. But um, so I, I got to be in uh, With Six You Get Egg Roll, and... Um, mainly working with Brian Keith, mm -hmm. who, who did the funniest thing. I don't know. I don't want to stop and keep telling stories. Like I think of them all the time. But no, no one, I'd love to hear this. No one introduced us on the set. It was a party scene. And I was someone who was uh, sitting across from him, chattering away the whole time, blah, 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 blah. And he's like being bored. But waiting to do the scene, um, we started waiting and then waiting a little too long. And it, it got to be weird because no, we're st just two people looking at each other. And then finally he looked over and he said, did you hear the one about, <laughs> and he started to tell us. <laughs> I thought oh, that's such a funny way to break the ice. I um, I don't remember a lot, but certain things are always in your head. Get over you, know, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but when uh, Darcy's husband, Marty Meltier, had passed away, um, he had made all these deals with her that uh, she did found out about after he passed away. And doing a series for CBS was part of that. Um, you came into the series after the series had already started. Yes, she kept having, uh, she was on a farm, then she went to a different office, she had children, then her children uh, were not mentioned very much, like at all. And uh, But I'm really glad about that, otherwise I wouldn't have had my two years doing that series. And the... the the fabulous thing about it, besides working with Doris, it, it was really fun. She decided that it was just dumb for actors to have to get up at 5.30 and have six o'clock calls and all that. She said, let's just start at 12 and we won't have a lunch break. And she brought in 
barrels of sandwiches around uh, after a couple of hours. And in between shots, you just eat all the, from Art's Deli, we had these amazing deli sandwiches and, uh, you know, free food. What, that'll never leave my mind as an actor. Um, so we had this great schedule at the end of the shooting day. Uh, they had a couple of director's chairs out and um, she picked two or three of her dogs who were very good that day. She usually brought six or seven dogs to work and they stayed in her little cottage. Um, that was her dressing room. And uh, it was so funny sitting there with dogs in, their, in the director's chair watching you shoot your scene. Good kids. They've well, already... you know, that brings me to a question that I want to ask you. I mean, both you and Doris are known for your love of animals. And God bless you for that, because I share that passion with you. Uh, but uh, when did you both discovered that you had such a love of animals? And if you can tell us about beginnings of Actors and Others for Animals, that you yeah. also started with Joanne Worley. Yes, she is now our current president. But um, at, at the time, my kids were in grade school. And uh, I was a room mother and also uh, Diana Basehart, who was Richard Basehart's wife, uh, leaned over to me and said, do you like animals? And I said, yes, I do. I have three dogs. And she said, okay, I've got to talk to you. When I went to work, which, which was at noon, so I could do my parents' meeting and then go do a series, uh, Doris leaned over and said, do you like animals? And I said, I, I love animals, of course. And, and it turns out they had started talking together and that uh, Richard and Diana had this group called Actors and Others for Animals um, and they needed to, to get bigger. And so we started meeting and plotting and how to have events. And um, the first event we had, it was, it was a meeting. I remember Ruth Buzzy and Joanne uh, Worley were there. And there we were we were just throwing out ideas to raise money. And one was saying, well, why don't we do a fair, you know, and have different little booths and sell different things, celebrity sandwiches or ritzy rummage, whatever. And so I went to uh, Diana and my grade school and at the Oakwood school, we did a fair. And I also got uh, a Sunday show uh, to come and broadcast from the fair. Um, and because of that, suddenly at this little school, 18,000 people showed up. And we were getting people from the crowd saying, would you run to the market and get some bread and peanut butter or whatever? <laughs> and so we, and the, the people making sandwiches were Tom Harmon and, uh, and Kristen, uh, who was married to, um, oh, help me brain, the, the wonderful young singer who died in an airplane crash. Um, John oh, Dinger? Um, he, he, he was uh, Ozzie and Harriet's son. Oh, uh, Ricky Nelson. Ricky, 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 mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, I, I'm giving it away. I'm elderly. <laughs> well, I am too. <laughs> I know. But, you know, we all have to have our forgettos. But uh, anyway, they all pitched in and we had this huge event. And in, in one room, uh, there was a room where it, anybody could take a picture, a Polaroid picture with Lucille Ball. And uh, that, like Lucy was in the room and little Lucy was the photographer. And, <laughs> and for $5, they could get a signed Polaroid with Lucy. Well, I can tell you by the end of the day, they were just fainting. It was so much, so much attention and, and such a big thing. And Doris was the auctioneer and she auctioned off a lot of her old fur coats because um, not that she wanted it to be a great prize, but rather she get money for them to help animals. And at, at that time it was, you know, we were picketing city hall and we raided a house that uh, where a lot of animals were abused by this one woman. And uh, 
what happened is that by creating this actors and others for animals group, any news about animal welfare was taken off the throwaway newspaper on the back page and suddenly was a big, big story in our LA Times. And, uh, you know, Doris Day in court fighting for um, animal rights and improvements in the shelters. I mean, the shelters were appalling. They they had Cretans who worked there and played baseball with kitties. I mean, it, it had no oversight at all. Mm. And so big changes happened. I, my favorite big change, I remember Earl Holloman and I and another actress called Jody Mann, we went to meet the uh, head of animal control. She wanted us to do an event at a, a new shelter in L.A. And, and we thought we could do an animal fashion show and have celebrities mm -hmm. come and walk some of the animals that were up for adoption. But we had a criteria. She had to put a black ribbon on the machine that killed the dogs. And there, you know, this terrible way that they used to, uh, as they say, get rid of the animals. Mm. And they just, you know, just threw them all there and alive and sucked the air out of them. It was just crude and, and uh, heartbreaking. And because that succeeded, because they thought we couldn't have them, our workers put them down with a shot. That would be, that would be too hard on them. And we said, give it a shot, give it a try. And th that suddenly pervaded, and all California suddenly threw away uh, the awful machines. God bless you for that. We were. It was timing and just doing the right thing, and I mean, such an opportunity to get to make changes like that. Well, and for me, that's what being celebrity is about. When you can lend your name to a cause like this and yeah. bring attention and awareness to it. I do want to ask you before I move on, yeah. um, we unfortunately lost uh, Doris a, a, a year or so ago. Um, yeah. What happened to all of her dogs? Um, did they find homes for all of them? Do you know? Oh, all of her dogs uh, stayed with the staff and, uh, and her cats too. She had a whole room with kitties in, in their little cages. It was so much fun to visit. And uh, she used to have a dog feeding room, a little doggy kitchen. It was like a high counter and uh, with uh, little dog dishes mm -hmm. all over the counter because they each had their own recipe for what was healthy for them. And around the room, Richard, if you can picture the walls of a sort of oval room, there were like baby cribs, and then under the cribs, there were like little uh, sleeping places. So there were dogs who had their own little place under a certain crib, and in the crib were the dogs who were uh, not able to walk and, um, and or, or blind, and she fed them all. They each had a little carpet that they would wait on, and it, it was so darling. And uh, I, I asked her if I could take pictures of that. And I, she said, as, as long as they're just for you. And um, I asked her a few decades later, um, when she finally uh, had her 90th birthday and allowed people to take pictures with her, with her at her age, she, she didn't allow pictures for a long time. She still looks stunning. I, you know, you shared those pictures with me, and she looked absolutely incredible. Well, she thrilled a lot of people when she showed up at that 90th birthday, and uh, it was a magical experience. Did she realize the love that people had for her? That's a few days before her party. I used to go up there for dinner. Because uh, you go for about a week with the and stay with the they call themselves the Daniacs. There's a whole group of fabulous people whose commonality is that they passionately love Doris Day. And what I told Doris is their only desire in life is to be able to thank you, just to thank you for the happiness you injected in their life. Just just by seeing you in the movies. And they they were so grateful to her. It wasn't like they were just 
dad fans. They mm-hmm. loved her. And 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 I, I told her, I said, they just want you to know how much it meant to them to be able to see you. And she came to the party. I tell you, when she walked in, because no one expected her. She never came out. That was too overwhelming. But when she showed up, you never saw so many people in a room crying, grown men with tears streaming, <laughs> tears of such joy and dreams come true. It was so touching. And since I had just seen her, I, I went up on the little stage that um, Peter Marshall was was uh, right. seeing and just watched the people watching her. It, it was just getting to see sheer sheer joy and 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 i thought inhale this mm-hmm. it's a great moment seeing this absolute impossible dream coming true for people now you know i'm all about celebrating artists and their bodies of work yeah. the art that they bring to the stage and everything and i don't really like to go into a person's private life but there is something that i want to bring up and i hope you don't mind sure. but um after you divorced, you started a group. Uh, you were the forerunner for the First Wives Club. You created a group for divorced women. And the list of celebrities that were part of this was phenomenal. Where did the idea come for doing that and creating a group to come together like that? Well, it's funny. I have to thank Ken for that because uh, after we were divorced, he was on the road um, with Patty, um, uh, Patty Dent. Don't anybody leave the room. Captain Stugan, Darren McGavin's wife. Okay. And that's when they were, uh, not Darren McGavin, Gavin, Gavin McLeod. Gavin McLeod. Okay, backwards. Gavin McLeod's wife was on the road with Ken. And when Gavin had called up and said, hello, I don't want to be married anymore. Well, she absolutely dissolved. And he called me and he said, look, Patty, she's crying all the time. Can you talk to her? Because he assumed that I was just blind. <laughs> 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 and this was six years later. But, you know, you when you're discarded, you... You, uh, you don't have very good feelings about yourself. Or unconsciously, you just know that uh, you let yourself walk off with your other person because that was your only value. And uh, I started talking to Patty, and about a year after uh, hearing her going, uh, she said, do you want to come to Lynn Landon's house? She's having a meeting with people in the like situation who were divorced from celebrities. And how how do you get over it? Because they're, you never get away. They're on television uh, or you hear their music, whatever it is. They're so present in, in the world. But how, how could you get over this special thing? So I thought, I'll go. I, I want to go see Lynn Landon's house. I had no <laughs> idea about a group. I just thought that'll be fun. And there was magnificent people there. I mean, like uh, Jerry Lewis's wife and Gene Hackman's wife. And, uh, you know, I hate to identify them, but that's mm-hmm. that's what impressed people. was. And because of that, we found that there, it was so therapeutic and, and so much healing was happening. And people were saying, wait, that's my story. That's how I felt. And and we realized that the it was the cheapest therapy in town. And that uh, through that group, uh, we decided to do a uh, an article. Mm-hmm. And uh, so like in, um, what was it? Uh, Good Housekeeper, one of those big, big women's magazines. There, there was an article by my friend Carolyn C, who was a writer, and uh, trying to share the idea that people should get with other people and talk and be uh, be a support group. So when that article came out, 
we got thousands, literally thousands of letters. And the magazine called and asked us if we would like to go on some uh, East Coast talk shows and, and uh, publicize the magazine. And just before I left, this is when God steps in and said, I put my hand and just grabbed a couple of the letters to take with me for some of these magazine shows. And I read them on the airplane. And one was from a national organization uh, called the Displaced Homemakers Network. And it was a place that little groups all over the country uh, were in a network so people could know where to turn in their community. So when I was on one of the shows and people were saying, how do I know where to go? My hand went into my very jumbled purse and came out with this letter. And I said, there's a place in Washington. So I, when I got home from that first appearance, I called this place in Washington and they said, what have you done? Because they were getting calls from like from Boston. And then I said, listen, you've got to tell me our next shop is, stop is here and here. And for our next stops, I had people from local organizations at the studio that could tell people where to go in their communities. And it, it was an effect that we had not planned, but it happened. And so you run with it. And then we went to Washington and started working with the Displaced Homers Network network. I mean, they would call us and say, can you go to Baton Rouge? Can you go to Birmingham? And we just say, sure. Okay. And, and we realized that, you know, to have a purpose and not just uh, feeling for yourself, it, it, there were so many people we were able to touch and, and they could identify and the only reason they went to these events was because they wanted to dish on Hollywood. <laughs> what it turned out with, they were meeting women who were just like them. And, and that's great. It, 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 we did that for 20 years. And I want to bring everyone up to date. Uh, your, your wonderful husband, David. Um, you know, how are the two of you uh, dealing with this crazy world that we're living in right now? Um, I want to make sure I heard your question correctly. Yes, I said, how are you and David both living, I mean, dealing with this crazy uh, world that we find ourselves in right now? Well, we have no other choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have a choice just to run out and be crazy. But uh, I don't understand. I don't comprehend why people think the mask is, is not a great thing to do. I mean, it's or just uh, mm -hmm. doing the right thing is so important these days, so you don't hurt others. I mean, uh, you know, look at people who are dropping unexpectedly, and and so any any little tiny chore you do, I mean, there's risk in everything. There's risk in delivery. There's risk, uh, you know, just walking down the street. It's. Mm -hmm. It, it's a time that you just have to work with acceptance. And that's what it is. And you take care of yourself and everybody else in sight. Uh, it's, it's still uh, inconceivable that we're doing this and have lived this last year. Because um, in my lifetime, which is really long, uh, Nothing ever just stopped. Uh, well, looking back over your career, Jackie, what do you think is the greatest life lesson that you've learned uh, that you've carried through your entire, uh, not only your personal life, but your career as well? Oh, my gosh. I think just to be amazed that anything happens mm. and appreciate these unexpected things. I used to drive my agent crazy. She'd say, oh, you got this. And I went, you're kidding. I, I was always <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm still amazed. And I'm amazed looking back at all the things I got. And I realized that, um, that people had a great deal of trust after they may have seen me working in other things. 
they just trusted that I could go in and make something out of something. And I mean, to do the Dick Van Dyke show and in your first run through or something, if you could make Carl Reiner laugh, I mean, you go home and that's your great moment. Not that you made somebody magnificent laugh. And um, I still think, wow, did that happen? You know, it, it, you keep being amazed, don't expect things. And then the unexpected is um, a thrill. I want to ask you, when it comes to your career, which, I mean, first of all, and you know this about me, I'm crazy. Every time I th think of you, um, I light up like a Christmas tree. Uh, oh. because, and so many other people feel the same way. But I said that you were going to be doing this show. So many people, we have a huge audience watching right now. Um, when you look back on your career, um, what was the lowest point for you and how did you get through it? Uh, and I ask that question because right now, many people are out of work. Uh, many people are worried about tomorrow. Um, today marks 293 days since our theaters shut down. Um, so I'd like to know, how did you forge through the low points in your life? I never thought the low points had anything to do with work. I thought my success as a human, uh, I, I felt my divorce was a low point because that I thought was the most wonderful, successful thing. And, um, and to suddenly realize that that was an illusion, um, that then you had to just creep through. And, and you know, that explains why it's so wonderful to be able to help other people make that jump from being disposed of into being your own person and to, to find your value. And uh, I mean, it, there's always something else you could do. That's always my advice to actors anyway, to young actors, of course. Um, I said, Go for it, study and be ready so when opportunity meets talent, you get the you get the opportunity to work. But always have another skill. Have something else you can do to function and and um, and make a living. And one other aspect about you that uh, is so wonderful is the way that you have embraced social media, Facebook, and you are really definitely hands-on and in touch with all of your fans. Um, was this something that you uh, came to with Welcome Arms, or were you reluctant coming into the world of social media? I just... I. I I just started answering people and, and finally figuring out that you have to join Facebook or, I mean, you, nobody has to join Facebook, right. but uh, I found it was a great way to communicate with people and to find people. And also, oh, this is going to sound so, um, well, whatever, I'll just say it. It's a way to make people happy sometimes. You know, if somebody writes a certain thing to you and you respond, that really makes somebody feel good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and uh, since, you know, I, I'm constantly figuring why am I living this long? And uh, so I must have a mission and uh, let it be making people feel good. Why not? And you certainly succeed with that. I can't believe this, but we are at the end of our show. Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Um, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you all did, uh, please go to my website, richardskipper.com. Sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. I love that. Um, and put your thoughts about the show. That helps to boost me and other markets. I also, if you are able, please make a donation uh, to actors and others for animals uh, oh, because, you know, it's important. Um, and, you know, when you do this, you can say, and I did this, uh, I do this in celebration of Jackie Joseph with all the work that she oh. does. They love you there. And, uh, you know, they're so hands-on. I love this organization. And anytime I can do anything 
for actors and others, for animals, I'm there. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list, um, go to the third name that pops up and give that person a phone call. Not a text, not an email, uh, call them and just say, this is, you know, you mean a lot to me. And Jackie, before we end, I wanna ask if there's anything, you know, I wanna give you the final word, anything that you want to expound upon that we talked about that you want to build upon or anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just any message that you wanna put out to everyone who's watching at this time. And Jackie, yes. I love you. I love you. I love, I love you. you. I, I'll quickly say, uh, the unexpected is sometimes the most fun things. Like in between work, once I had a job working for Liberace for one day as his maid, I had a little French maid outfit because he had a new carpet from China and it was a big white and gold. And so all his guests when they came in had to have their shoes taken off and put on little gold booties. So I was the booty lady and I, I had to take their shoes, uh, but they were a lot of famous people. And and in fact, even Bert Convy and his then wife uh, were guests and they would, I think they felt awkward because I was the maid and I was their friend. <laughs> and pretended nothing was happening. But I mean, things like that. I, I took Helen Hayes to Disneyland. I mean, things that have nothing to do with show business, but are, I took her to McDonald's because she was in a movie with Ken at the time, Herbie Rides Again, and he said, oh, Jackie can take you. And I thought, I could barely speak. It's Helen Hayes, you know, <laughs> theater. I made stuff like that is just little delicious parts in life. So well, before we end, I want to tell you, Helen Hayes, I live uh, very close to Nyack, uh, where Helen Hayes lives with Pretty Penny was her home. And she was uh, the most accessible person on the planet. Um, Sunday afternoons, you'd be walking around in Nyack and there would be Helen Hayes. Oh. She opened her home on uh, Sunday afternoons in the summer so that all the kids could come and go into her swimming pool oh. in the backyard. She was everyone's grandmother. She was just the most wonderful person. But I have to ask you, what was the reaction from everyone else when you and Helen Hayes were at Disneyland together? I don't think a lot of people knew who she was. I mean, and But Helen was just, you know, I thought I'm going to give her the best Disneyland she's ever had. And I said, uh, Helen, have you been here before? She said, oh, yes, I, I came with B. Lily. Uh, <laughs> and I said, oh, who was your host? And she said, Walt Disney. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll try and live up to that. But I mean, she was funny. She, we watched a parade and saw Minnie Mouse and I said, well, she's never looked better. And Helen just cracked up. She thought that was so funny. And I thought, oh, she never looked better. She never looked better. I made Helen laugh. You know, it's, I'm, you know, a huge fan. I, you know, I love wonderful, wonderful actors and, uh, and as do you. I don't want to take up too much time. No, 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 no. You can take up as much time as you want. Uh, uh, again, uh, I am forever grateful. I mean, you opened your home when Danny and I came out to California. We spent an afternoon with you. Um, oh. Spent the early part of the day uh, with Marge Champion, who oh. at that time was 100 years old. And then we came and spent oh. the afternoon with you. And it truly was uh, the highlight of our trip. Oh, I'm so thrilled. See, I could make you happy. You can make you me do. happy. It's, it's so doable. Make well, me happy. I, I love you, and I wish you and David the happiest new year. And we're going to get through this so we can get together again soon. Okay. Okay. I love you. Love Good. you too. Bye, everybody. Bye.